Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our fall 2021 virtual Rebel Recharge lecture season. We have a great lineup of engaging and educational talks that we're excited to share. You can see our full schedule of events at engage.unlv.edu slash events. My name is Stacy Purcell and I am proud to serve as the president of the UNLV Alumni Association. And it is my honor to personally welcome each and every one of you here today. I would also like to give a special welcome and, and shout out thanks to Blake Douglas, Associate Vice President for Alumni Engagement and our Executive Director of the UNLV Alumni Association. Also, Renee rivera Gelfi, our Coordinator for Programs and Events for producing today's virtual lecture. Our next virtual Rebel Recharge is scheduled for Friday, September 17th. In observance of Hispanic Heritage Month, the topic is engaging Nuato Aztec philosophy in uncertain times, presented by Amy Reed Sandoval. Our goal is to continue to grow our programs and events and create fun educational and engaging opportunities for our alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community members. In addition to that, we continue to create partnerships that offer benefits to our growing alumni network. As rebels, we are trailblazers and we're proud to be the first university to establish a partnership with US Bank and their goals coaching initiatives. Here to share more about this free goal coaching program is Marta Dipchinska, who is the Higher Education Enrollment Advisor. I give you Marta. Take it away, Marta. Great, thank you, Stacy. I also would like to thank the UNLV Alumni Association for allowing us to be a part of today's introduction and for our continued partnership to assist students with their life beyond academics. And so my name is Marta Dipchenska and I am one of the goal coaches here within US Bank. So when you think of your future, um, you know, do you have a partner within your life that's helping you fill in the gaps? And so as goal coaches, you're able to discuss a variety of goals with us that vary from pursuing a passion, paying down debt, or also building your career, right? And so when thinking about your career, you know, what do you think of? Are you thinking of the definition of what you define a career? Are you thinking of an income? You know, what comes to mind when you think of a career, um, a ultimate career? So you'll be able to discuss your goal as well as different strategies after the goals discovery process that help you come up with an action plan to, to get there. There's also not one or two goals that you may have in mind. Maybe you still need to discuss and figure out some goals. That's also what we're here for. And the last part of the goals coaching process is going to be sticking to the action steps and, and the plan that you ultimately create for yourself. And the next slide is going to be a QR code as far as meeting with the goals coach. And so everything that we discuss is confidential. There are no products that we're going to sell you and we're also not financial planners. So there's ultimately no uh, cost associated with meeting with the coach. So if there's any kind of goals that you're thinking of or wanting to discuss further, that's what we're here for. So thank you uh, again for the Alumni Association for allowing us to be here. Thank you, Marta. I'm excited to have this partnership with US Bank and look forward to you all taking advantage of this free opportunity. And now it's time for me to introduce our speaker for today's program, Dr. David Schwartz. We are so happy to have you back here for another wonderful lecture. Dr. Schwartz is a professor, gaming historian, and ombuds at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Dr. Schwartz researches focuses on gambling and casinos, video games, popular culture, Las Vegas, tourism, and conflict resolution. He is also the executive director of the Far West Popular Culture Association and has written several books, including At the Sands, The Casino That Shaped Classic Las Vegas, Brought the Rat Pack Together, and Went Out with a Bang. We are thrilled to have Dr. Schwartz with us today once again to share his research 
and perspectives for lessons learned from COVID-19 and the path ahead. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much, Stacy. It's great to be talking with the alumni and members of the community. Just give me a second here while I try to successfully share my screen. Okay, I think that did it. So brief talk today. I just want to run over a couple lessons we hopefully have learned from COVID and what's going to happen in the future. And to do that, it's going to be in three parts. First, we're going to talk about what has happened in Las Vegas, then what we learned, and finally, what's next, what's coming next. Okay, so what happened? Here we have a picture from last March, April, when the casinos were closed. So the first warning signs were in February of 2021, when the casinos in Macau shut down for 15 days. And at the time in Las Vegas, people said, well, hmm, that could never happen here. First reported case in Las Vegas was March 5th. The phase started closing. They did more cleaning. They said, if guests want to cancel, they'll let them cancel. MGM then announced all resorts would close on March 17th. And Governor Sisolak closed all casinos for 30 days initially the next day. So as you can see, this wasn't even two weeks between the first case in Vegas and total shutdown. They reopened June 3rd at a lower capacity with social distancing. Some still have not reopened. So I've got a polling question. Uh, the question is, do you yourself, did you transition to remote work back in March 2020? And the answers are yes or no. Okay, and looks like three quarters of us, about three quarters of us did transition to remote work. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there. Cool, great. Yeah, so about three quarters did. Let me share results. Yeah, great. Okay, and thank you, Renee. So the impact of this closure was unemployment obviously went up. Gaming revenues, which account for about 30% of Nevada's general fund, plummeted. Severe economic problems at the statewide level, as any state employees know. Even after June 3rd, when casinos opened up, conventions and live entertainment still weren't back yet. They're in the process of coming back now. There was a lot of uncertainty. So there's really two phases of the recovery. So the first phase was from June 2020 to March 2021, when you still had states with travel restrictions, there was still a lot of hesitancy, and the casinos weren't really back. The most beneficial customers for casinos are the international visitors, followed by convention guests, followed by leisure guests who fly in, and they all stayed away. The least lucrative is the drive-in customers, and they were the most, you would find them all over town. Also, a lot of the high margin amenities, things like the nightclubs where they have the $600 bottles of vodka were not open. So if you don't have a nightclub open, you can't sell a $600 bottle of vodka. The gaming revenues were about half what they'd been before, even though in a lot of markets around the country, they went back to normal. Okay, so my question about the recovery is this. If you look at the numbers, before you even adjust for inflation, Nevada gaming never recovered from the Great Recession. 2007 is still the top revenue year, revenue year in history, not even 2019 was bigger. As there's a lot more gaming around, it's very possible that people are going to stop coming to Las Vegas. Non-gaming had been the replacement for gaming growth, but... COVID shows that there's a lot of vulnerabilities there because if people can't do things gathering together, that hurts a lot of, a, of the non-gaming, like entertainment. So I've got a polling question. What percentage of your work has returned to in-person? And the answers are 25%, 50, 75, 100, or still fully remote. So we have a second polling question there. 
a quarter is in person, 50%, three quarters, 100%, we're still fully remote. Okay, and I love these polling questions. These are really great. And it looks like about half, less than half have returned to full, uh, about a quarter, 75, and 50% is the least, fully remote, about one in five. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Okay. So more recently, in June, the June gaming revenues for Nevada were higher than they were in June of 2019, which is a good sign. Allegiant Stadium is now fully open. Visitation is going up. I just read a tweet saying that the visitation for June was almost where it was in 2019. So things really are moving up. But then now in the past couple of weeks, we have the Delta variant, we have mask mandates, we have vaccine mandates. So that has the potential to cause a lot of disruption. If people are arguing over whether they should get the vaccine, it's not going to be easy to tell everyone who comes to Las Vegas they need to be vaccinated. Okay, so what did we learn? Okay, lesson one. I think we learned that tourism is very resilient. If you, you know, if something's wrong with your computer, it's pretty easy to turn it off and turn it back on again. You know, we've all done that. We've never done that with gaming and tourism. We never would say, eh, let's turn off the Las Vegas Strip. But we did it. And we learned that you can do that and you can turn it back on because the tourism has come back. So that's good. But we also got a reminder of how critical gaming and hospitality remain to Southern Nevada. So how important they are. Lesson two is directly related to lesson one. Las Vegas and Southern Nevada still need to diversify. Literally, if you go in the Las Vegas age is available online for, three, for free through the university libraries, you can literally find articles there from 1920, 1921 saying we need to diversify, we need to diversify, we need other stuff. So we've known this for over 100 years. But when you have 43 million people a year paying money to come to your city, it's kind of easy to not make it a priority. So even though Southern Nevada is still very reliant on it, we need to do something and the time is now. There's never going to be a better time. Lesson three is that people can quickly adapt to, I'm putting in quotes, new technology. A lot of office work and education went remote at this time. So a lot of people learned to work remotely. And this has a couple of effects for Las Vegas. First of all, if you can do an IT job remotely, and I'm definitely not the first person to say this, but I do want to note it, you don't need to live in San Francisco and pay $3,000 for a room in an apartment when you can spend $2,000 for a five bedroom house in Vegas. So number one, this, I think, not ironically, but maybe fittingly, is going to open up a lot of opportunities for diversification as people can change where they live and where they work. How they live, you know, what do people do for fun? I think it's also going to change how they seek entertainment. People may say, oh, you know, going out, it's such a hassle. We want to just stream it. You know, Las Vegas needs to adapt to that because people are going to continue adapting to this. Lesson four is that people still love Las Vegas. Okay, as state started lifting restrictions, as it started becoming safe to travel again, people were literally flocking back. So a ton of people were coming back. Las Vegas, I would say is irrepressible. I mean, you really, you think of this, this is the biggest challenge to tourism, you know, probably since World War II. And Las Vegas, less than a year later, has numbers that are equal to what they were before. That's a pretty good sign. So Las Vegas is not going anywhere as far as a brand. Whatever happens, people are gonna to wanna to return with the caveat that we have to give them a reason to come back. You know, we can't just get complacent and assume they'll definitely come back, you know, build it and they'll come. We have to give them a reason to come back. Right, so what's next? Well, I have a quote from you about the future. We're all interested in the future for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. 
And remember, my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. That, of course, is from the amazing Chris Well from Plan 9 from Outer Space, the um, widely considered the worst movie ever made, although Manos, the Hands of Fate, might give it a run for its money. So the polling question is, what is the biggest area of uncertainty you think that we're facing as a region? Number one, health, medical, vaccine related. Number two, economic. Number three, political. Number four, technical. Ah, let me go back. What do you think the biggest uncertainty we're facing is? Is it the vaccine itself? Is it the economy? Is it the politics around vaccination and various stuff? Or is it whether technically we can go? Hmm. So, all right. Health medical had an insurmountable lead, but it's now tied with political, or not tied anymore. People like this one. So it's, it's clear that it's, there's both a health crisis and a political crisis. And I'm certain that we have a lot of talented political scientists and social scientists at UNLV who maybe in future uh, sessions will be able to talk with you about that. I think there's a lot of great people here working in that as well as the medical and health issues, which you have a lot of experts about that. Okay, so think about uncertainty is this. We like to believe the world is predictable. Often it is, a lot of times it isn't. And the idea that things are unpredictable, I think is the first step we have to take so we can really plan for the future. For a long time, the gaming industry, which I studied closely, pretty much plotted the future like a straight line, just saying, well, here's what happened over the past five years, and this trend line is going to continue forever. Revenues are going to go up, occupancy is going to go up, room rates are going to go up forever. Hopefully, what we've learned from the pandemic, a fifth lesson, is that this is not the case. I mean, we should have known it before, but we should really know it now. This is not the case, okay? We have to factor uncertainty into our plans. You can't rely on the last five years to predict what the future is going to be, okay? That's just not going to work. There's a lot of things that may be unforeseeable. So we have to be honest with, with ourselves, and it's scary. We don't know what's going to happen next, but we can predict how we're going to face it. We can have an idea. We can have contingency plannings. I'm going to share a quote that's attributed to Dwight Eisenhower, but there's a little bit of debate about who actually said it and how. But Eisenhower said, you know, when it comes to the battle, plans are useless, but planning is everything. So the plans themselves, and I'm sure you know, all of you who are in business have experienced this in your own, own life or event management or anything, especially event management. I mean, when you plan, you think you have all the contingencies, but reality shows up, you have to throw that out the door. So the process of planning for the future, even though it's not gonna guarantee you that that's what's gonna happen, it will give you the tools you need to face whatever does happen. So you have to actively plan for a range of outcomes, you know, expect the unexpected. Then, you know, prepare to improvise based on what you know. Okay, that's all. My last image here, I want to, I want to thank everybody, Stacy, Renee, everybody who's put this together. My last image here is the dice in the air, just to underline our sense of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I would now love to get some questions from folks. I'm going to stop sharing so we're in somewhat of a more face-to-face -face basis. You're not just looking at a PowerPoint slide. If you have any questions for Dr. David Schwartz, feel free to unmute yourself, and he's happy to answer any questions. There's one question in the chat. Did you want me to? Oh. You're on mute. I'm on mute. I'm muted. So there you go. So I see the question about the positivity rate at 16%. Vaccination rates are below. Well, you know, I think a lot of it's, I think there will be an impact as word gets out that people are getting COVID in Las Vegas. I think that could have a significant impact. You know, I think some people have shown that they have this fatalistic attitude towards it. Hey, what happens, happens. I'm going to live my life. Other people are more cautious. So I think best possible world, we can get that positivity rate down. We can get the vaccination rates up. I think a lot of this is going to be informed by what, 
happens at the events. You know, I've read that vaccinations required, the Raiders are requiring that now. You know, I think if this becomes more common around the United States, we'll see vaccination rates rise just as a function of that. So I think that has a significant risk, you know, if those positivity rates keep going up, significant risk. Also to amend that too, and by the way, thank you for your time, Dr. Hey, Schwartz. You know, also too, I think, you know, being a Nevadan, but also like living in California during the pandemic, we obviously know through like county health data that, you know, the site of test is actually determined as where you have COVID, you know, the, as we've all seen, tracking has been pretty bad, at least, you know, the specific tracking. So, you know, in California specifically, like what casinos were doing out there was basically saying, hey, you don't need to go to Vegas to get exposed, come to us. Like San Miguel was kind of doing that as well. So it was something that uh, was on my mind because of this, because this PR will eventually get out, specifically like California, maybe even like Utah. So. Yeah, you know, I think I think that is significant. And I think that's why folks in the hospitality business are trying their best to manage this. But yeah, that that is definitely a significant risk. And if this does keep on spiking, it's not going to be good. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And I'm glad somebody got the Manos, the Hands of Fate reference. Yeah, thank to Miss, thanks to Mystery Science Theater 3000. There's a ton of uh, really bad movies I've, I've seen. Yeah, other questions or thoughts? There's another question that just came into the chat. Okay. Again, if you want me to read those, I'm happy to do Please do, because I don't think I see that one. Sure. With reduction, uh, with reduced conventions and nightclubs and shows potentially restricted and no international, um, is the business model on the strip in question? I think it's in flux and I think it has to be. And the problem you have, and I've said this before, is basically you look at a 3000 room casino resort as a machine. And when a lot of these were built in the nineties, the purpose of the machine was to get the customers next to the slot machines for about three or four hours a day. And everything functioned to do that, to get them to do that. That shifted in the 2000s. As we had proliferation, it became the purpose of the machine is to get people here for conventions, to get people here for fine dining and for shows, and to get their money that way in addition to the casinos, uh, you know, the gambling itself. So you basically have these machines that have to be adjusted. So how do we do that without the conventions? You know, it's not, it can't, it's going to be very different. You can't rely on that revenue base of, yeah, we're going to get 15 to 20% of our guests from conventions and they spend on average, let's say 15% more than the non-convention guests. They have to, they have to change that. So there's going to be a lot of difference. And I don't think it's going to be, and it's kind of like going into space where there's no one moment where you can say you're in space, the atmosphere just kind of gets less and less dense as you go up. It's not gonna be like, hey, we're back. It's gonna be a process. And conventions are gonna eventually come back, hopefully, but that's gonna take a while. Live entertainment is also tricky because even before the pandemic, even when you were packing those rooms, and maybe somebody here works, works in entertainment can, can share this, but looking for numbers, it's not a very high margin business. So even when you can you know, sell out, it's still pretty expensive to be in. And when it's at a lower capacity, it's got to be even worse. So it is going to take some time to do that. OK, I have another question about buffets. Buffets are coming back. You know, They've been pretty durable. They've been around since the 40s. We have seen them start to return. And the question is whether we go back to the old model of, you know, the big cafeteria pan, pan with mac and cheese and everybody serves themselves, or whether we go to the more artisanal thing where you have the small plates and people take what's in the plate and you don't go into the pan. So I think there's going to be a lot of discussion in the industry about what the healthiest way to do this is and then the most cost effective way. But I think they'll be back 
I think Vegas is a phase, they're closely enough identified that people will continue to do that. Okay, next question. Kennedy Center will provide, right? Yeah, so there are places that are providing, they do have vaccination requirements. Okay, I, Aaron, I've not been tracking the SES scores of casino workers, so I'm not the best person to answer that. Although that is something that should be done. Other questions, if you have them, or comments if you don't. Um, I would reach out to the International Gaming Institute. I think that, that would be a great start. You know, there's a lot of really good people working there and they are doing so much for innovation. So I think they, I think that, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, and I don't have their contact information hasty, uh, handy, but if somebody else does and wants to pop that in the chat, that might be a good idea. Okay. COVID was challenging, okay. Yeah, you know, again, I think, okay, so let me go back to Susan's question. You know, I think the, the thing about diversification is that every, we've always said it's a good idea. It's always been a goal. It's only when things, when hospitality really gets challenged that we do it. And then again, when you have millions of people coming each year, you have less of an incentive because, hey, the money's coming in well. You know, I will say coming from Atlantic City, New Jersey, this is what really hurt the city for a long time in the 80s and into the 90s. They had people coming in and playing slot machines. So, hey, that's working. Why diversify? They didn't and it hurt them. So I think it's an important to do that, even though there may be less urgency as we see the gaming revenues go up and the budget start to get better. It's, you know, it's very essential. Okay. Um, question, do we know who's still getting sick with COVID or Delta? I feel like I wish I had Brian Labus on speed dial because he's the, he's the man here at UNLV who can answer that. I personally don't know that the answer to that, but okay. Um, so Susan wants to know, is Vegas losing its focus on economic diversification? I think it has the risk of becoming less of a top of mind thing and more of a we'll get around to it thing. You know, I do know that there are a lot of people at UNLV working in this and there are a lot of people in the state government really trying to promote it. But I, and I think it's just gonna come down to keeping the focus on doing this even in the good times, not just the bad times. Okay, um, local, so question about locals spending. Locals gaming, it's interesting, if you look at Nevada, locals gaming and gaming up in northern Nevada and Reno recovered before the Strip. So locals numbers have been pretty good. You know, the Strip is the one that's fluctuating. Oh, good question here from Aaron about MGM properties and the release back agreements. Okay. This really is, and it's funny because we have somebody on the call who I think, at least I thought I saw him on the call who, you know, this is his bread and butter, and I feel kind of funny speaking about it, but I actually, I don't think he's in the call anymore. But um, basically this is the next evolution of how they're gonna be owned. And if you look at the history of casino ownership, they started with multiple owners in these small syndicates, much of the money coming from under the table from around the country, you shifted to the corporate ownership and that structure. And now this is the next shift into the real estate investment trusts. And I think that is going to have a big impact when people are building properties, you know, are they building them saying we're going to manage this for 20 years and get our money back then, or we're going to build this and then sell it to another company and then get a contract to manage it. So I think it will have that impact. Okay. Yeah, you know, I think Tony Shea, him being gone is good. You know, he was one of the big drivers of diversification for downtown Las Vegas and such a champion for downtown Las Vegas. So I think his absence is going to be felt. Yeah, other folks, happy to answer other questions. I think I've gotten all the chat questions. I'm trying to stay on top of that. Okay. 
Okay, great question from John. This is drawing on my gaming history. I feel like I wear so many hats now, like ombuds, doing conflict resolution. I'm teaching a class about video game history that starts on Monday. So I'm glad I get to go back to my bread and butter with gaming history. So yeah, you know, we've had these innovators. Yeah, beyond so Derek Downtown is a big one. So that's a big one. I think the other, you know, a lot of it goes down to the ownership. And it used to be that there was a huge incentive for these entrepreneurs to come in. The cost of entry was at a point where somebody could, Steve Wynn could borrow $300 million, which is a lot of money, but he could do it and build the mirage and change the paradigm. I think in today's atmosphere, you know, when it costs $3 billion, $4 billion, you're not going to see that. The idea, I, the focus, I think, more is instead of the individual entrepreneurs having these outside groups come in. We've seen that with Resorts World coming from Malaysia. I think the Seminoles and Hard Rock International is the next major group that's going to get into Las Vegas and change things. I think we're generally going to see a shift. You know, if you look historically at what happened, the casino gaming industry was basically, you know, Apologies to Reno, but the resorts as we know them basically were built in Las Vegas in the 50s and 60s, and then spread throughout the country starting the 70s to the 90s. What we're seeing now is we're seeing a flow back, you know, from Indian country, the Seminole Group, Mohegan Sun, running the casino for Virgin Hotels. We're seeing this flow back into Las Vegas, and I think. The thing that, that always made Las Vegas a great place for innovation was that they didn't mind when people came to town with a lot of money to build and ideas. So, you know, whether it was Billy Wilkerson with the idea for, for the Flamingo or, you know, Jay Sarno with Caesar's Palace, you know, people have money, want to come in, hey, we'll have them. I think we need to keep that mentality it's good to be open like that. So I think we're gonna see that. You know, I also think we're gonna see a split in what's happening. You know, I think that you're gonna have folks who specialize in the resort side and folks who specialize in the gaming side. So we're already seeing, you know, MGM is branding Bet MGM as their gaming thing. Caesars has the Caesars Sports as their thing, you know, which is a national brand. I think we're going to see that applying to the gaming space more, especially if it goes, if casinos go online in Nevada fully, we'll see sort of, we'll have one brand for the gaming aspect, and that'll be its own thing, and then we'll have the property developers. So I'm guessing, you know, we're going to see a lot more people running real estate investment trusts and property developers as opposed to um, the entrepreneurs who do it all. Because again, like Steve Wynn, having interviewed him, the one thing that's impressive about him is I felt that you could talk to him about any aspect of the casino resort and he would know more about it than you. So he could talk about the rate of pour of the concrete in the foundation, then talk about the artistic merits of the entertainment, then talk about the finance and getting money from Wall Street. And I don't know that we're going to have anybody who has that same breath. So follow a question about the MDA. Yeah, I think it is important to, and the question is, is it a leader or is it an icon or is it the person that people identify? You know, do we want a mascot, for lack of a better term, or somebody making the decisions? At the end of the day, it's a hospitality business. And I think, you know, Derek Stevens downtown has showed that there is a lot of upside to having the owner who's down there at the mega bar or the long bar or wherever, who's down there in the sports book who people can see. I think that is important. It humanizes the business. I think as the, and I'm just kind of saying this off the top of my head, it might come out weird. You know, we've seen in the past, 10 or 15 years, the threshold for celebrity diminish. So it used to be that you could be famous if you were really good at sports, if you were a politician, or if you were in movies or TV, or were CEO of a business, you could be famous. You know, now we've got 13-year-old kids on YouTube or TikTok who are, you know, more famous than CEOs. 
So I think keeping that in mind and keeping the power of that brand, it is a good idea to have people in the, in the casino business develop that kind of persona, have that out there. So I think that's very important. Okay. Um, so great question from Aaron about does Las Vegas not become the center of the gaming industry? I mean, it could happen. New Jersey makes more money from sports betting than Nevada does. And as California opens up, New York opens up, these other states open up, you know, the companies, again, if we see this change, we may see that we have a property resort management company that's headquartered in Vegas. We have a gambling subsidiary, betting subsidiary that's headquartered in New York or New Jersey. And we have a real estate investment company headquartered in Switzerland that owns everything. So I think you will see Las Vegas is not going to be the place you go to get funding you know, not where you go to build it, maybe not where you go for the gaming, but it may still be for the resort management. So Susan's not related to the Wynn family. Um, yeah. Ah, what trajectory should UNLB be supporting right now to minimize those future negative impacts, maximize positive opportunities, grow enrollment, communicate and demonstrate community value? Excellent question from Susan. I think the first part of that is the last thing you said, community value. UNLV, you know, it's great that we're a top tier university. It's great that we're doing this cutting edge research. But at the end of the day, we are still Southern Nevada's urban university and we never can lose sight of that. And I think President Whitfield has done a wonderful job of keeping that, you know, at the forefront of what we're doing. So most important is to maintain our ties to the community. I think with students returning this week, you know, I was out on campus before, they've asked me booths out, and it's wonderful to see that happening. You know, that is really our bread and butter. That's the students and the community. I think beyond that, we have to look at partners in the community, people we can work with. We have the U.S. Bank Partnership that we're talking about. I think that's a great example of how the university and folks in the community, community partners can work together. I think we have to take the, the four lessons to heart, you know, expect the unexpected, plan for stuff, but have a lot of possible outcomes. You know, I know right now, everybody over on the, you know, in the instruction side, me included, you know, we've got a bunch of contingency plans. Yeah, about 80% of us are back in person, but if things go a certain way, we're gonna switch to remote, you know? So I think that's, that's the key. And again, just being open to the community, okay. Ah, Stu has a question on inflation, fuel prices, dining prices, lodging, and Las Vegas tourism. Okay. Interesting thing about Las Vegas is that going up to 2007, the biggest correlation, the biggest drivers of the growth of gaming revenues in Las Vegas was high consumer confidence and low unemployment. That is what drove the domestic market. And when you had stuff like fuel prices spike, you know, if you talk to economists, they were even, the folks at the, at the um, gaming control board, the economists there could even predict like, okay, a 10 cent increase in gas prices will have this effect on the gaming revenues. As the gaming mix in Las Vegas has shifted, that's changed. The bigger factors are now things like international relations. So for example, if there's a trade war with China, suddenly the Chinese millionaires and billionaires who were coming to Las Vegas as high rollers aren't doing that anymore. So there are inflation. Historically, it would be easy to say, okay, inflation, this much inflation will lead to this much of a decrease in gaming revenues. We can't do that precisely today, but it definitely is a negative impact. You know, the dining prices, it goes, to, the, the price thing goes two ways. During the recession, casinos, a lot of casinos lowered their room rates and said, all right, we're going to lower our room rates. People will come pay less in the room, spend more in the dining and entertainment. I was doing a little project, some outside consulting where I was shopping a casino for a potential buyer. And I was just spent about 45 minutes hanging out in the elevator lobby. And I saw a ton of people bringing pizzas up to their room from outside of the hotel, bringing Burger King up to their room and stuff like that. So I wrote up a report saying, well, there's significant upside for increasing the dining there because most of the guests aren't 
doing it. And they saw that across the strip where you had customers come in who wouldn't pay the extra money, you know, that premium for dining there. So you have one school of thought says higher prices in the strip are bad because people will spend less. The other school of thought says, well, it will draw in customers who are comfortable spending that. You know, historically over the past 10 years, I would say that school of thought that says you want to raise prices that leads to higher revenues has been right. You know, as much as personally, I, if I was running a casino, I would have much more of a value oriented model, but this is why I'm not running a casino. We see though, that when there's a pandemic that goes out the window and people go back to the, the bargain. So I think if you, you know, if the market bears it, it's great, but when it doesn't, all of a sudden it gets real bad real quick. Okay. Thought from Jenny about large entertainment venues, big artists coming in for residency. Is that the future? You know, I think in a lot of ways it is. They've certainly invested a lot. And if you're on campus, you can see that MSG sphere project that looks like a sphere now or half a sphere now. So I think that's, that's the future as, and again, if we look at Las Vegas back in the 50s and 60s, Sure, Frank Sinatra was an attraction that got people there, but the real attraction was the gambling because you couldn't do that anywhere else. And you could see Frank Sinatra in other places. So as great as Sinatra was, you know, that was the attraction. And much of the other entertainment too, you know, Sinatra was one that was probably the greatest person in Vegas history who brought the high rollers in. All the other people were there, you know, just to, as an amenity. I think what we've seen is with gaming proliferating around the United States, and especially with travel being more restricted, people will still travel for these opportunities to see these artists in these unique settings. So I think that is gonna be a big future for entertainment for sure. Yeah, so Aaron, I agree. I think the funding formula changes will benefit UNLV, but there's a lot of real experts in that here. Um, that know a lot more about that than me, but I'm just glad that we are able, you know, our team was able to make that happen. And I think we owe them a lot of thanks. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I'll do this one over sure. the you know, recording on this one. So I don't know if you uh, talked about this yet, but what is the end over end differential in international visitors in Las Vegas or the change from 2019 to 2020? It's so just anecdotally, I imagine it's pretty big just because of other countries having travel restrictions. I haven't seen the numbers from the LVCVA, the Las Vegas, Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority that would back it up. But it seems to me when you have a lot of these countries, you know, the UK having travel restrictions, Canada having travel restrictions, you know, those UK, Canada and Mexico were the three biggest contributors to people coming to Vegas from a numbers percentage when you have the flow of customers from Asia, which is many of the high rollers cut, you've seen it's it's pretty big, you know. And again, we've seen that because that's the major, um, you know, probably the most lucrative. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a while back I did. I don't want to call it a study. I just did some calculations, and I said, like, oh my god, even if the United States domestically was still going full throttle during the recession, just cutting off the international travel, so just closing the United States' borders would make casinos unprofitable. That was, if I rem remember and I, my numbers correctly, that was about 20% of the revenues and they don't have a 20% profit margin, so that'll do it. So that is important, okay. So Macau, yeah, I mean, Macau has that because there's a lot of people in China who want to gamble and Macau is the only place they can do it. You know, I don't know that Las Vegas ever reclaims that just because the nature of gambling is changing. More people are going to be doing it online. So I think it's going to be, we're going to see places like Pennsylvania and New York and California catching up to Las Vegas if they haven't already, as opposed to Las Vegas catching Macau. So I think... You know, when people think about gambling in the United States and Europe, they think about Las Vegas. I think for a lot of reasons, Las Vegas is, you know, has that cachet. I think we need to continue to trade on that. Okay, question. How much revenue is Legion Stadium bringing in? That, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I hope it's a lot because there was a significant public uh, 
outlay to get them here. And I hope they would be able to use that to help education, which should be a big priority. Okay, Resorts World, question about Resorts World. It seems to be doing pretty well. You know, again, they're not opening in the time they probably would want to have opened, but it's a the first major big new from the ground up resort to open on the strip in quite some time. And I think this is exactly what Las Vegas needs. You need new people coming in with new ideas and trying them out. Okay, so post here about travel restrictions for most of Europe and several other countries. And then they also have travel restrictions against us because of our positivity rates, yes. Yeah, visa, yeah. All right, so a nice discussion there. Other questions? Dr. Schwartz, it's Stacey Purcell. You've been so thought provoking in every way. It's so hard to, you know, know all the different, it's such a big universe of, of uh, dynamics with, you know, the casinos, which is my business, uh, 30 years at Seizures Entertainment and the entertainment piece, the gaming piece, the, you know, leisure travel, all those different market segments and the international piece is daunting as well. I've seen compression on the strip properties and then non-strip properties are struggling. It's been a little bit of up and down, but, you know, we, you're right. I mean, the, the resorts world coming in different pieces, Allegiant, different entertainment opportunities really help put that positive pressure on moving uh, the ball forward. I think for us is what I've seen, just my own humble opinion. But, um, you know, the rates, you mentioned something about lower rates, um, you know, sometimes maybe closing up inventory too, to kind of compress that would have been helpful and not increase the rates like, uh, you know, going home to Maui a month ago, the rates at Grand Wailea was $1,200 a night. I couldn't believe that, but they told me they did reduce their inventory. And then uh, coming back home and seeing, you know, $49 at different places. And so there is a value proposition. And, and we do look at that as a consumer. I look at that. And then how can this city, you know, during this time uh, be helpful, more helpful to UNLV at all times, you know, always advocating for that. What can they do to help us, you know, attract and, and help us educate us and communicate to us and keep that pipeline open uh, of, of, uh, you know, the science lab of, you know, how can they do that to help us? But you have so much knowledge and I, I'm so appreciative and I just wonder how you keep it all, you know, it's so much. I think a lot of the, a lot of it comes down to having a lot of conversations with very intelligent people like we're having today. So that's, I think that's most of it right there. Yes. So a couple more questions. Trump Resort, I won't get into the politics of it at all, but I will note that at one point, the Trump Organization had four properties in my hometown of Atlantic City, doesn't have any today. So I think that's a question how they're going to evolve. You know, they went out of the casino business into the hotel business. It's possible they evolve out of the hotel business into something else. You know, I think that's, that's for them. Also, question, what should state lawmakers be doing to promote stability for the industry as a whole? Well, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to having that regulatory structure that understands the challenges the industry is facing. I think they have had that benefit. You know, gaming is a very heavily regulated business. So I think having that regulatory stability, which is important even when the legislature's not in session, is a key part of that. And I think they've done a pretty good job of doing that, you know, certainly facing unprecedented challenges. Any other last minute questions for Dave? <laughs> if not, thank you so much for taking the opportunity to present to us today. Um, we really appreciate you coming back and presenting. I know that we have, we'll have you back in the spring sometime. So we're excited to have you back in the spring. Um, but thank you again. And Stacey, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to close as well. And Dave, if you have any last minute um, closing remarks as well. 
Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. You know, I know it, you've all got a lot of things to be doing with your day, and it still blows my mind that people want to take an hour out of their day and hear me talk. So I'm, I'm really grateful and, and thankful to you all. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. What a great way to end our, our day, our week, and, and just thought-provoking in many ways. Great to have you back, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue and keeping in touch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you again soon. See you at the next Rebel Recharge. And we will be sharing the recording, so I'll be sending that out um, by the end of the day today. Have a great weekend.